Again, thank you very much for participating in the APW interview. Um, I know you're quite busy at the moment, so we thank you for your time. Um, I know that you're uh, alumni of the HPW and you're currently doing your postdoctoral research in HIV in the USA. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so first of all, that's very inspiring and motivational. So um, uh, we would like to hear more about your experience as being part of the HPW. How long were you involved in it and what was it like? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Asmita. Uh, I have been in HW um, since 2011, and I think I've been there for about four to five years. And I became an alumni then, I think, when I was going to leave the country. So it's it's been a great experience. I, I've, I've really uh, seen myself grow through the program, and I, I, I think there's just so many memories that I don't know which ones to pick. But all I can tell you that it's it's been one of those letters that actually brought me to where I am. Okay. And during your time as being part of the HPW, um, who was one person that inspired you or motivated you the most? Well, it's very hard to pick one person in particular. Because I've met a lot of different people. I've been there for a while, so I've met a lot of different people who have mm -hmm. been very inspirational. Um, but there were some people who were very intriguing, some characters who were very intriguing. And I, I would think of one top of my head, I would say uh, Peter. Uh, he was involved in like warming up everybody during, uh, before and, and, and after the, the, the whole course started. So um, I think I remember the first time I heard him speak, I wasn't actually looking ahead at him, and he was speaking in Corsa. When I turned around and I saw it was a white guy speaking in Corsa, I was quite fascinated. And and yeah, ever since then, I realized that it it was a group uh, full of like very different people with different backgrounds, and it's just it's just hard to pick one person to say like one person. Um, I've been inspired by a lot of people. Okay, no, I'm, I, I would understand. So how did it impact your life being part of HPW as well as the influence on your educational ventures? So when I joined HPW, I think at the time I was still doing my honors degree. And as far as I remember, my idea was just do your honors degree, you know, get your degree and uh, pursue a, a job. But mm -hmm. the program kind of like opened up a new um, spectrum of things it made me realize that there's way too much out there. The thing is, when you get into this program, you know, you you start to learn things. And I think there's a difference between learning things and memorizing things. Once you start learning things, you know, you, you kind of like retain so much information that is usually um, functional rather than just uh, being in 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 you know, a memorizing person just to go get a job. So I think I retained so much information and it was getting more interesting and I wanted to learn more. And the only way to learn more was to get advanced education. And I realized that through this program, you know, doing my education and also incorporating this as part of my, my, my daily routine, it really influenced me a lot. Building me from being, you know, uh, a guy who already had some background on, on presentation, but it kind of boosted my morale in, in, in public speaking and, and socializing with other people, which I think is a very um, strong thing. I mean, I'm here because I can pretty much communicate with, um, with a lot of people, particularly when it comes to my field of work. So mm -hmm. I think I think that's, I, I've, I've found it to be a very useful, um, useful program. And I think to this day, I, I, I always follow it up. So it's the best thing to be in it. Oh, that sounds really very inspiring and it sounds like you had quite an awesome experience. Um, yeah. So for the students out there who are not in the field of climate change, would you still recommend that they participate in the program? And if so, why? Most definitely, most definitely. I don't think the HBW is just for climate change uh, people or climatologists. I was a biologist at the time when I joined, and the program is designed and set up in such a way that 
different fields come together. It's like a multidisciplinary program, wherein even though the main focus of the theme is about climate change, you could see the overlap of all these um, different uh, disciplines and you see how they interact and they all form a part of a bigger picture of mm -hmm. climate change. So it affects everybody. I don't think you have to, um, just because maybe you're doing physics or you're doing uh, economics, and you, everybody's involved when it comes to climate change. Okay. So now I would like to know more about what you are currently doing. So what does Dr. Godfrey do on a day-to-day -day basis? Man, it's, it's, a, it's not a straightforward answer, but <laughs> I have a lot of things that I do. So, but to, to give you a, a picture is that I, I am currently a postdoc in, in, in a lab by David Rikosh and Lou Hammerjolt, and I'm working on HIV latency. So what I do is we're trying to find ways of reversing viruses that has been latent and um, killing it with the drugs or killing it with some sort of a target. But to do that, one has to understand how the whole mechanism of, of latency happens. That's why I come in, um, where we're trying to um, figure out the mechanism of uh, latency and whether different viruses uh, go to latency in different ways. And, and so currently I, I, I am in charge of um, the BSL3 lab, which is where we grow live viruses. And I'm also um, playing a very major role in uh, other projects in the lab, which are dealing with um, cancer studies like uh, human, human retrovirus, human religious retroviruses that people are, are talking about. So my, work, my daily schedule is it's always in the lab, working on my data, writing papers, and, and trying to be updated with, with the literature. It's a new experience every day, in other words. Every day it's a new experience. There's just, there's just always something new to do and always something more to do. So I never get bored of my work. It's not like a routine <laughs> work. It's always something new. That's cool. So as a virologist, um, and from what you just said, it sounds as though you're exposed to viruses on almost a daily basis. Would you have envisioned something like the current coronavirus to have become a global pandemic on such a magnitude? Okay, so let me just put something to clarity. I am a, a retrovirologist, which Okay. I'm a specialist in retrovirology, so the knowledge that I will give based on coronaviruses is only limited to the knowledge that I've read on the articles and the ongoing um, articles that are coming out. So uh, we, most, most scientists knew this from the beginning that any virus that is able to transmit between population or within population and mm -hmm. transmit in such a rate that it stays longer, like having longer incubation periods, has always been a threat. And, and, and we know that especially respiratory viruses, they spread really quickly. And I think it's, it, it's something that has been um, foreseen that this thing is gonna happen. It's just that when, when a virus is not there yet, it's very hard for people to invest a lot of effort into, into blocking something that they don't see or stopping something that, that they haven't experienced yet. Mm -hmm. But right now, you know, I think, I think coronaviruses didn't, to virologists at least, didn't come as a huge surprise. Maybe, maybe to the whole population, but to virologists, they we kind of like saw it coming. So it's, it's, um, it's not a huge surprise. All right. So with your research with the HIV virus, is there anything that we could learn from that in regards to our fight against the COVID-19 coronavirus? Yes, there's a, there's a lot that we learn from, from different viruses. So retroviruses are like HIV. We know that the reason why HIV is so hard to, to deal with is the fact that it not only goes latent, but also it, it has this high rate of mutation, which makes it mm -hmm. difficult for the immune system to recognize the virus. So does the coronavirus. So what happened, I don't know if you've been following the news that the first coronavirus is not the same one as what we have right now. It has mutated, especially in this uh, protein they call the spike protein. This is the protein that helps the virus to get into the cell. And that mutation enabled the virus to be able to be more efficient in getting into cells and then thus 
having a high rate of transmission. And then now it's having a high rate of morbidity and mortality. So I, I think what one can learn from, vir from viruses like HIV is that, yeah, viruses are real. They will mutate. If the conditions are favorable, we have a lot of crowds. They will be jumping around people, and as, as, as they jump, they will be acquiring mutations, and they can get they can be good mutations or bad mutations. So um, we know that HIV does that. So this is also not a surprise that viruses like coronavirus will do that. Okay. So in other words, the emphasis on stay at home becomes more and more. It's very uh, important. <laughs> it's very important. I I understand it's not easy to stay at home uh, after being told that there's something called a virus that is out there that you can't see. It's hard for people to, to kind of like take it in. But the truth is, this thing is there and it's infecting everybody. So staying at home is the best thing people could do. Mm -hmm. Um, while we are actually on the topic of um, HIV, so South Africa recently lost um, a professor, Professor Geeta Ramji, who was actually one of the leading researchers, I believe, in HIV yeah. in South Africa and globally. So what would your take be in terms of educating the population on on the ferociousness of this virus? I mean, it's taking out not just the common man or, you know, selected population groups, but anyone and everyone can be and will be affected at some point. So what yeah. is your take on that? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's really sad that, you know, when I saw the news, uh, I, I, really, I really wish it wasn't true, but it, it happened that um, Professor Gita, uh, Gita was... Um, uh, had he uh, had some complications with the infection, and that kind of like you know led her to succumb to this virus. It was a great loss because she was one of those people who uh, really played a major role in HIV prevention, especially among women. And the, those news didn't come um, very well. So, but but what what you can get from this is that. This virus is not just affecting people who are working uh, in close contact with old viruses or people who are traveling only or people who are black, white. It doesn't care. If you're a human being, you are susceptible to being infected with the virus. And I think it is, it is worthwhile, you know, to keep on saying the same thing. Like people should really do what is responsible by, by taking the, 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 uh, recommended precautionary measures: staying at home, washing their hands frequently. Not for, not for, if not for their own good, but for other people, because mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a real thing. It's not just some propaganda, or it's it's a real infection, and we're trying to really so hard to 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 get to fight this thing. On the note of propaganda, and maybe on a slightly lighter note. Um, I've been noticing a lot of photos circulating of um, marine life and other animals suddenly coming closer to the coast, roaming freely on the streets while humans are pretty much locked down in their homes. Um, would you think it's some sort of a conspiracy theory of the earth to keep uh, humans away and restore the balance of nature? <laughs> uh... Okay, so I know this can be a little bit controversial, okay? So True. <laughs> uh, now that people are being under lockdown, it is, it is, there, is, there is good evidence that shows that, you know, shutting down of, of different countries, may, uh, we see a very decrease in carbon emissions. And that is true for China, true for all the big major cities which were really uh, high contributors to carbon emissions. And when you have, when you have that, I mean, some so I've I've looked at some data that actually shows that they do see some um, recovery of of um, circulation systems, but mm -hmm. I, I feel like you know this could also be blown out of proportion and say, well, it's this is the time now for activists to say, now you see that when we <laughs> stop doing these things, you get it's. It, there's a good reason. Yes, it's true. The data says that we have reduction in emissions. Um, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I think I don't think it 
should be it would be a good idea if people over over present this as if it's like it's really making a major long lasting effect because let's say let's say we continue with this what's going to happen is that the climate will have to adapt to the new conditions and those conditions could be good or bad it means it might start getting colder or start getting warmer we, we don't know so I don't think anyone can say just because we're stopping. It is good that we do reduce the emissions because we see, I mean, the quality of air now in China is really good. Uh, mm -hmm. But we'll see what's going to happen when, because they just resumed work, I think, a week ago or something. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that, that changes. But I mean, I'm seeing that once, once everything goes away, it's going to be business as usual. And it might yeah. even get worse because everyone will try to recover the economy because they have to cover up for what they've lost. So we will see, but I think I don't think people should, you know, the earth, <laughs> the earth is not something that thinks. It's just, process just happens, you know, the process just happens. So it's just that humans always want to find a reason behind things happening, like, you know, the planet is punishing us. Or, no, 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 no. Let's just <laughs> not put too much thought to that. All right, back on a more serious note. Um, what do you currently envision the outlook for South Africa to be under the COVID um, commotion at present? I think right now, South Africa is, is in, I would say it's in the better situ situation for several reasons, that they have been a little bit tougher in terms of uh, implementing the, the, the measures to prevent spread like the mm -hmm. lockdown, for example. And I think doing it as early as, as South Africa did, it's, it's much more beneficial what, what, than what you're seeing outside. Like here in the United States, just yesterday, um, uh, I think it's uh, in Florida or something, they just started doing a lockdown then. It means sure. that people are still roaming around. And you can imagine if people are infected, it means they've been spreading the virus. So a lockdown for South Africa, it's, it's a good thing that things are happening this way. Mm -hmm. What worries me is, um, is the fact that the number of uh, tests that have been done daily are a little bit too low to give us a clear picture of where we stand with the virus. But I think within the coming few days, we're going to see a large number of tests being done. And I think then we'll know how, how good things are in South Africa, because once you get more tests, you are able to discern how many people in the population are actually being infected. So I don't think people should also be scared when they see a rising number of cases, uh, like a sudden jump, because we're just yes. getting kits right now to do more mm -hmm. tests. So that, that will be something that people should expect. But I think South Africa right now is doing good. As long as people adhere to the rules, and I know it's very difficult to adhere to these rules. Like, I mean, staying at home is not a normal thing for you, most human beings, at least. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we just have to, you know, you know, sit it through. I know it's difficult, but let's just do what you have to do. Okay. On that note, while you're away from home, what what does it feel like to be in another country? I mean, you are in the U.S., where um, currently it's the highest number of infections. How do you feel about that? Yeah, for me, I'm not really scared about that. I think it's more of my... Um, my parents who were worried about me, um, mm -hmm. that, I mean, they're seeing this, I mean, also the news, you know, you know how reporters kind of like Again. give the data out <laughs> there. They throw it in a way that it's so dramatic. And, and yes, even though it's true, it, it does scare the, the normal, like uh, an average person will be, will be terrified by the data. But, mm -hmm. but I think, I mean, I'm, I'm currently also, you know, we've, we've ceased doing HIV work now. And we are moving towards doing COVID-19 work because we can't afford to push on HIV, whereas there's a problem at hand. So I'm currently now, we just recently started, I think a week ago, started acquiring COVID material. And we're going to be working on that to try to find um, ways of um, getting drug targets that can uh, prevent entry of the virus. So my parents, are, I think, I don't really, I think it's what I'm supposed to do as a virologist. Not, not to be worried about getting sick. I have to take care of myself. I have to protect myself. But it's part of, it's part of my, my discipline in my career. So, uh, I'm not. Duties. 
Yeah, yes. I'm fulfilling my duty. This is when I need to like do what I need to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so you said you've been working um, with the COVID virus now. Um, yeah, so, sorry. I just started working with it now recently, so it's a work in progress. I'm learning um, a new. Just all right. So given that um, and your knowledge on um, the progression so far of the virus, how far away do you think we are from actually finding a vaccine or a cure for COVID? I would I would not rush to go for a cure, but I would say when it comes to vaccine, it's it all depends on the process of making a vaccine. The process is a bit longer because first of all, Let's say you do have a vaccine. You need to find ways of making mass producing it. And once you mass produce it, you need to find ways of distributing it. So those processes are quite longer. But as far as I, I've seen, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of red tape has been removed. Like things are moving so fast that anything that comes out now that is ready to go for a clinical trial, it will go for a clinical trial. So with that said, a vaccine for coronavirus most people think 18 months, but you know, 18 months is when all the good conditions are met. When you have the effective vaccine, when you have everything ready, then definitely we might get it in 18 months or so. But before we get those things, it, it will be very difficult to say uh, anything under 18 months. It might even be longer. But I don't think people should, I, I think right now, most people are doing vaccine work, but what is more important is finding treatment because we're dealing with people who are already sick. So treatment is looking for the drugs and stuff because vaccines only work for those who are not infected, right? You give a vaccine to a person who's not infected to protect them from the virus. But treatment is going to help those who are already infected to try and reduce the symptoms that usually lead them to severe cases. So I think treatment is what people are pushing more. And then vaccine is also a big agenda. But but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if it takes longer than eighteen months. It t- or usually takes longer for a vaccine to be pulled out. I guess at present prevention is better than cure. Exactly. That's when that statement comes into play. <laughs> okay. And finally, what advice do you have for our planeteers in the fight against the COVID nineteen pandemic? Uh, I think they should keep on doing what what people are calling social distancing. I don't think I want to call it social distancing, physical distancing, because we are always socially connected by network or anything. So physical distancing is the best thing you could do for yourself and your friends and your family and your loved ones. And also washing your hands regularly. This not only protects you from coronaviruses, but it also protects you from other germs because a person who will wash their hands much more frequent than the other ones, most, less likely to catch a virus or any form of bacteria because our hands really are always touching our faces, even though we're not you know, aware of it. So I think, I think doing those things will kind of like reduce you know, your, your chances of catching a virus or if you do have the virus, chances of spreading that virus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So just, just do what you need to do. Be a good citizen. Okay. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Godfrey, for your precious time and for all the insights and enlightening information you have given us today. And um, we urge our planeteers to continue staying at home, wash their hands and to be safe. And we'd like to wish you everything of the best in your fight against COVID-19 virus, as well as um, continuing with your research in HIV. And uh, yeah, wish you everything of the best and thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to have had this, it was quite relaxing, so, but now I have to go to work. So uh, um, um, I hope for the best as well. I hope um, everything goes well, that side as well. <laughs>